of Orthodox spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekea. Hello, dear listeners. We are continuing to read from the book Spiritual Awakening, the second volume in the series Spiritual Councils by Saint Paisios. We ourselves should not create scandals. As far as possible, we should be careful not to give cause for ugly situations to develop. Let us not open cracks to the deceiver, because the souls who have faulty thoughts are harmed and are only seeking an opportunity to justify themselves. Then we end up building with one hand and tearing down with the other. Some time ago, some young modern men came to my Kalivi and we had a discussion. That day, I was planning to go out from the holy mountain. When they learned of this, they too decided to leave the mountain and came and sat beside me in the boat. They were asking me with great interest about various spiritual matters. However, some people on the boat misunderstood this and were looking at us suspiciously. If I could have foreseen that others would misunderstand our conversation, I would have taken measures to prevent it. People are devious. We must be careful not to create scandals. We are not responsible for what we cannot take measures to prevent or for matters in which we have no experience. But we must not expect a reward from God when we create problems through carelessness. We have a reward when we are careful but the enemy creates problems nonetheless. Someone tells me, for example, that I am in error. First I will see if I am in error or not. I think to myself, for him to say that, he must have seen or heard something. He cannot just say that without any reason. He must have misunderstood something I said or did. And I try to find out where or how I have been misunderstood in order to correct it. If he says that I am in error, a sorcerer, this is a gain for me as people will not come to me and I will find some peace. But that poor man who says such things will be condemned because he harms the church. Isn't it a pity? And I am to blame because I was careless about something. Some people come to kiss my hand and in an effort to avoid that, I pat them lightly on the head. One who sees that says, Look, he is blessing them when he is only a monk. What does he think he is, a priest? It's not their fault. I should be careful not to do it again. Yaroda, when someone out of carelessness creates a scandal, some people make the remark, Leave him alone. He has the excuse of not being responsible for his actions. The excuse of irresponsibility applies only to one who cannot think, not to one who is careless. The careless person lights a fire and does not think that where he has lit it, it can cause a forest fire. When from time to time such a person lights a fire and singes a few other souls in the process, we have a duty to pray and pour a pail or two of water onto the fire. Also, there are others who are headstrong, they are pious to a fault, and when they hear something they disagree with, 
they react violently without first examining if it is right or wrong. It is then that we must sometimes discreetly step on the brakes, and again, when they stop, discreetly jam a stone against their tires to prevent them from rolling backwards and running over other souls. What scandal mongers some people are! Do not readily believe everything you hear, for there are some people who relate things as they themselves understand them. Once someone went to Hadz Effendi's and told him, That is how the residents of Farasa used to call St. Arsenios of Cappadocia after his pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Hadz Effendi's is a compound word from Hadzi meaning pilgrim and Effendi's meaning person with authority. Give me your blessing, Father Arsenios, because a hundred snakes have gathered up there. A hundred snakes? Where could they have possibly come from? Father Arsenios wondered. Well, if they were not one hundred, then surely there were fifty. Wow, fifty snakes. There were at least twenty-five for sure. Again the saint wondered and asked, Have you ever heard of twenty-five snakes coming together? Stop it right there. It is not possible. Then he said there were certainly ten. Really? They were having a conference and ten snakes got together? There had to be five, the man said then. Five? Well, maybe just two. Then Father Arsenios asked him, Did you see them? Well, no, but I heard them in the bushes making a loud hissing sound. So it could have been some lizard. I try to never draw any conclusions from whatever I hear until I've had a chance to examine the matter. Some people may say something to criticize. Others may simply be relating a story, while yet others may relate it with an ulterior motive. What scandal mongers some people are. In Konitsa, there were two friends who were very close. On holy days and Sundays, they didn't wander around the town, but instead came to visit the monastery in Stolmion. They also enjoyed chanting. Afterwards, they would take a hike up the mountains to the Camel, the mountain peak on the Bindos Range, which has the appearance of a camel's hump. One day, a perverse individual sowed discord between these two friends. He went to the one and said, Do you know what your friend said about you? He said this and this and that. Then he went to the other man and told him, Do you know what your so-called friend said about you? He said this and that. Soon after that, the two men had an awful argument right in the monastery. In the meantime, the instigator left the area and the two men continued to argue terribly. The younger of the two was rather hot-tempered and started calling the older one names. Right then, thinking to myself, Look what temptation can do. What shall I do now? I went to the older man and said, Look, he is young and a little hot-tempered. Don't get him wrong. Apologize to him. Father, he tells me, how can I apologize to him? Don't you see how he's calling me names? I have no idea what he's talking about. Then I went to the younger man and said to him, Look, he is older. Things are not as they seem to you. Go and apologize to him. But he got enraged and started shouting, Father, you and I are going to have a fight of our own as well. Well then, Pandeli, if we must fight, let me go and get ready, I said and went away. Outside the monastery, I had some long sticks I was planning to use for a garden fence. I walked about 400 meters and picked up a stick nearly 5 meters long and started to drag it slowly, hoping to make him laugh. He could see me dragging the stick, but could not imagine what I was going to do with it. Then I came into the courtyard holding the stick in my hands and approached the area of the narthex. Then I said, Come on, Padeli, now I am ready for our fight. And I poked him with the stick. That was it. Both men burst out laughing. The ice was broken. The devil went away defeated. What foolishness was this? Are you fellows in your right mind now? I told them and their friendship was restored. Was the slander spoken on that same day? Yes, and they were swearing at each other terribly. See what the devil can do? 
The other fellow was probably jealous of them for their wonderful friendship, so he slandered the one to the other and then went away. Slander is truly evil, and this is why this type of temptation is called by the name of the tempter, that is, the diabolos, the devil. Calumny, slander in Greek, is diaboli. He says one thing to one person and something else to another person in order to deceive and sow discord. And you see how even good friends can believe the lies and be caught in the devil's snare. Did that individual spread the lies about the two friends intentionally? Yes, to separate them out of love, namely envy. The Publication of Sins When we see something unseemly, it is better to cover it rather than make it a matter of public scorn and ridicule. It is wrong to publicize moral transgressions. If some foul-smelling waste material is found along a path, a prudent person will make some effort to cover it with a stone to prevent any further disgust. But an impudent individual, instead of covering it, may begin stirring it and spreading its foul smell even more. By the same token, when we indiscreetly publicize the sins of others, we bring about greater harm. The scriptural verse, Tell it unto the church, Matthew 18 verse 17, does not mean that everything must be made public, because today not everyone is part of the church. The church is the faithful who live as Christ desires, not those who oppose the church. The verse, tell it unto the church, had that particular meaning during the early years of Christianity, when confession of sins was performed publicly before all the members of the church. In our time, when hardly a family can be found to have the same spiritual father, let us not be fooled by the devil with the otherwise meaningful verse, tell it unto the church. For when we publicize a moral transgression, we make it known to the enemies of the church, giving them opportunity to oppose the church, thus shaking the faith of the weaker members. A mother who has a daughter who is a prostitute does not calumniate and ridicule her in front of others, but rather does everything in her power to restore her daughter's name. The mother will sell whatever she can to raise money. She will take her and go to another city. She will help her to get married in order to correct her former way of life. This is precisely the church's way. The benevolent God tolerates us with love and does not expose anyone even though he knows the decadent condition of our heart. The saints too never embarrassed a sinner before other people. Instead, through love and spiritual sensitivity, they quietly try to rectify and overcome the evil. We, however, even though we are sinners, do just the opposite, like hypocrites. We must be careful not to be easily shocked and think that whatever others do is evil. Yaroda, you refer to the publication of moral transgressions. What about other types of sins or sinful conditions? Is it necessary under certain circumstances to make them public? Let me explain. I do this to some of the people I know. For example, I see someone doing something bad and scandalizing others. I tell that person one, five, ten, twenty, thirty times to correct himself, but he doesn't. He has no right to continue his disorderly behavior after being told repeatedly as others will be misled and imitate him. You see, people readily imitate evil, but not good. So then I have to tell others who see this bad behavior in order to protect them. In other words, when I say, what so-and-so is doing does not please me at all, it's not to condemn the person. I have already told him that so many times. It's because others who see his bad behavior are influenced and might imitate him. They may even say, since Father Paisios does not tell him anything, it must be all right. If I do not speak out that I am not pleased with this bad behavior, I give the impression that I am blessing it, that it pleases me. 
but then the whole is destroyed. For people will consider that particular behavior as acceptable and worthy of imitation. And what can come from that? In the meantime, they think that I have not spoken directly to the person about this matter. They have no idea that I have struggled with this matter for such a long time. And we also have the devil adding his share. It's all right if you do it. Look, that other person is doing it, and Father Paisios has not told him a thing. So when I see that someone continues his bad behavior, even though I have repeatedly asked him to correct it, I will make it a point of mentioning to anyone who knows him that so-and-so's behavior does not please me. And this I do, as I have said, to protect the innocent from evil influence. This is not condemnation. Let's not confuse the two. Now some will come and say to me, Why did you tell this to others? It was a secret spoken in confidence. What secret? What confidence? I spoke to you a thousand times, and you did nothing about it. You have no right to harm others who may think that I agree with such behavior. When harm can come to others, I have an obligation to speak up, and God forbid if I do not, especially when I am dealing with a young person from a family I happen to know, and I see that his behavior is destroying the family. I tell him, Look, if you do not correct your ways, I will speak to your mother. You have no right to come and tell me and then to continue as you please. I will speak to your mother in order to protect your family. Now, if he feels repentance, that is all right. But when he continues his disorderly conduct, I must speak up. I have a responsibility to do so. Chapter 4, Actions with Prudence and Love, Cultivating Ourselves If you want to help the church, it is better to try to correct yourself, rather than be looking to correct others. If you manage to correct yourself, one small part of the church is immediately corrected. Naturally, if everyone did the same, the body of the church would be in good health. But today, people concern themselves with anything but themselves. You see, judging others is easy, whereas working on yourself takes effort. If we work to correct ourselves and look more intently towards our inner activity rather than our external, giving precedence to divine help, we can in turn be of greater and more positive help to others we will also achieve an inner serenity that will quietly help the souls of the people we encounter because spiritual serenity reflects the virtue of the soul and transforms souls. When someone applies himself to external activity before having polished his spiritual inner state, he may struggle spiritually, but he will be fraught with worry, anxiety, lack of confidence in God, and frequent loss of serenity. If he does not improve himself, he cannot say that his interest for the common good is pure. When he is liberated from the old self and all things worldly, then he will receive divine grace and be not only at peace with himself, but also able to bring peace to everyone else. But if he has not received the grace of God, then he can neither govern himself nor help others in order to bring about a divine effect. He must first be immersed in divine grace and then utilize his resulting sanctified powers for the salvation of others. Good deeds must be done in a good way. Yeroda, how do you think when you have to deal with a problem? I think of what is humanly possible and what isn't. I examine it from all perspectives. I will do this. What consequences will it bear on this, 
on that. What good can it bring or what harm can it cause? I always try to see a problem from many aspects, so the solution I come up with will be, as far as possible, the correct one. Many mistakes can be made if one is not careful. If one realizes afterwards what should have been done, it is of no benefit because, as people say, the bird has flown. Let us say, for example, someone was being careless and burned a house. Well, perhaps no one will hang the man, but the damage has been done. People had a problem somewhere. The person in charge came to me and said, Well, now the problem is solved. I went and found so-and-so. I told them this and that, and the matter is now settled. I said to him, The problem has just started. What you had in your hands was not a problem. Now the fire is really burning. At first, there were just two pieces of coal burning that would have burned out by themselves. That person thought that through his actions the problem had been solved and even expected to be praised. Whereas with what he did, he created a big fuss and magnified the problem. It takes a lot of attention, prudence, and discernment because good must be done well and be of benefit to others, otherwise it may demonize them. Also, if there's something that you're thinking of doing, allow the thought to mature before doing it. If you act prematurely in haste, you may later have other problems to torment you. The serious issues, when delayed a little, will later proceed properly and efficiently. Someone may be clever, but he may have vainglory and egoism, negative qualities that run ahead of his actions and lead to carelessness. For example, a hunting dog, even if not purebred, will find the rabbit if it advances carefully. On the other hand, a purebred dog, with all the necessary qualities, if too hasty, will run left and right without any results. Action before thought contains pride. One must not be in a hurry to act. One must first think and pray before acting. When prayer comes first, then it is not the froth of the mind, its frivolity, but the sanctified mind that will guide the process. Spiritual people sometimes act as if there were no God. We do not allow God to act. God knows how to work. While there are spiritual means to solve difficult circumstances, we try to act by worldly means. When I was at Mount Sinai, every Friday, a Muslim cleric would go up to the minaret of a mosque at the monastery and cry out the call to prayer. And what a loud voice he had. I could hear him all the way up to the hermitage of St. Episteme. Later, the monastery found a way to prevent this by closing the door on Fridays when the Muslim cleric would make his visit. But I knew nothing about this. One day, on my way out, I saw the Hoja furious. Now I will show them, he told me, for closing the door and not letting me in. They closed it, I told them, so the camels will not get in. I don't believe they closed it to keep you out. After that, I said something to the fathers about this. One of the secretaries replied, I'll show that Muslim cleric. I'll set him up. I will tell the government that the Muslim cleric is harassing us. Look here, I said. Orthodoxy is not into setups. Let us keep a vigil. Let us chant the service of the Holy Fathers of Sinai, of St. Catherine, and let us allow God to speak. I will also go up to pray. I also told a few of the fathers to pray, so that in the end the Muslim cleric received an effective slap in the face. He got up, left the area, and disappeared. For even if they had locked the door, the government would have seen that the cleric was not in fact harassing them, and they would be in trouble with the authorities. The cleric would have said that they closed the door to prevent him from entering the monastery each Friday, and this would have created a problem for the monastery. Another person 
in the past saw the awesome mountain and wanted to build a country home on the summit of St. Catherine. He fell ill, died, and was gone. Then another person came later to build something at the same place, but he too died and is gone. This is why we should not rely only on our own human efforts. We should pray and allow God to act. Discreet Behavior Yeroda, when we see someone behaving badly, should we try to tell him something? It depends on what kind of person he is. It requires great discernment and divine enlightenment in our time. It is not easy to tell you exactly. In a given case, as I have seen, there can be 500 variables. There are some who can be corrected and others who cannot, and may even react badly to one of our remarks. Especially if someone is an egoist and you offend him, he will react badly. While often realizing he is wrong, he won't give in because of his egoism. And when our motives are not pure, when our concern for others is tainted with pride, and our love for them is not pure, then those we try to help will react badly. When we censure someone with love, with pain, whether he understands our love or not, the transformation can take place in his heart simply because we are motivated out of pure love. But censuring someone without love, with animosity, will infuriate him because our evilness collides with his pride and causes sparks to fly just like when the steel strikes the flint. When we endure a brother out of love, he understands it. Even when our evilness is not revealed but is kept inside, he can feel it because it agitates him. This is like the appearance of the devil in the form of an angel, which causes agitation and fear, while the real angel brings a peaceful, inexpressible exaltation. In other words, Yeroda, if we say something and produce an agitated reaction, are we acting from egoism? Many misunderstandings occur as well. People interpret the same thing differently. One must always examine oneself. Why do I want to say this? What are my motives? Do I really suffer over this or do I want to appear good to project myself? If we are cleansed and purified, then... Whether we become angry or we shout or we censure, our motives will be pure and everything will go well because we are acting with discernment. For discernment is purification, divine enlightenment, spiritual clarity. Consequently, how can egoism enter into that equation? And when our motives are pure, we are at peace. This is how we can distinguish whether or not our every action is good. Often you may not realize that the manner in which you say something to someone has a bossy air. This must be done precisely in this or that manner only. Egoism enters into the picture and the other person explodes. If the motives are pure and there is humility, the instructive remark will be of help to the other person. Otherwise, egoism comes in and has the opposite effect. Remove yourself, your egoism from your actions, and then you will be motivated by pure reasons. Indiscreet behavior will often do more harm than the irresponsible behavior of the insane, because the indiscreet wound sensitive hearts with their sharp words and will often mortally traumatize them by leading them to desperation. There are some people who behave in the same manner toward everyone. But we cannot fit into a thimble what we can put into a barrel, nor can we load onto an ox as much as we can on a horse. The ox is good for pulling the plow. It's inappropriate to saddle it and load it. The horse again is not meant for the plow, but to carry weight. One animal is made for one kind of work, and the other is fit for another. Let's not try to fit the whole world into our mold. Each one has his own. Let us overlook a few things when they are not harmful. If it were possible to put all the people in this life in order, then there would be no disorderly behavior, and we would have paradise here too. So let's not have irrational expectations of others. Dear listeners, our show has come to an end. 
thank you for listening. We will continue once again where we left off in our next show. Until then, be well. Readings of Orthodox Spirituality A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekeak